we go. Okay, we are ready to start the second section of Tanya, which we call Shara Yichid Vamuna. But as we'll see, the Alter Rebbe actually also called it like he does the first section, Lakute Amarim, which translates as a collection of sayings. And we'll get into some of the detail as to why he calls it that and what it means uh, and the similarities. In, in addition, as a bit of background, what we call Tanya is actually a compilation of a few different uh, originally individually published works. And the Alter Rebbe actually considered, and we'll see it alluded to in the first couple of lines, to print this part of Tanya first before he printed. Remember, printing it was a radical step. Uh, Hasidus had never been printed. It had always been taught individually with the teacher, and there was back and forth, and there was discussion. And putting it in a book and putting it on a bookshelf allows everybody access to it, even without any guidance, and therefore it's easily misunderstood and misinterpreted. As such, the Alter Rebbe made this radical step to print Tanya and to print the Svarim of Chassidus. So one idea was to print this section first. Ultimately, he decided to print the Sefer Shel Bainim first, which we completed studying. The primary difference between the two is the Sefer Shel Bainim speaks about how one has a relationship with the infinity of Hashem, how we overcome our impulses, the understanding of ourselves, <clears throat> the different forces that operate within us, our animating self-preservation, impulsive sense, our distinctively divine, selfless, godly sense, the struggle between them, the ways in which we can gin up uh, the capacity to overcome our impulses, etc. This section of Tanya speaks more directly about Hashem. To understand God, what does it mean that God is one? What does it mean that God is uh, infinite? And as we were mentioning, the essential theological conflict, that if God is infinite, then how can I exist? And if I exist, then how is God infinite? my existence would seem to suggest that God stops where I start. Or if God is infinite, then I have no meaning and no significance. This is not only a theological, philosophical discussion, it manifests itself in an extraordinarily uh, tangible for format. If I take the position that God is only infinite, uh, then my life has no meaning because God is infinite. What does God care about what I do? What, do, what does anybody care about what I do? What is my behavior have any impact on anything. It's a certain uh, distorted form of bittal where I am so insignificant that only God exists. If we take the position that I exist and therefore God's infinity is compromised because how can God be infinite when I'm here, then whenever something God says that I don't like, well, I'm here and I don't like that. <clears throat> God is infiltrating my life. So when I want God in, what does God do for me? I'll take it. But if it seems that God is interfering with my life instead of enhancing my life, then I say, no, thank you, because I exist. So this innate conflict between God's infinity and my sense of existence has to be resolved. Now, the Alter Rebbe is certainly not the first one within our world of Torah who tries to solve this issue. Uh, he, it, 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 the, the key to the answer lies in the term and the doctrine called simtum, which we will discuss at some great length, but should not be um, confused with the various understandings of this term of simtum. There is the simtum means to contract, to pull back. So there is such a position in the world of Torah people I'm talking about that says that God is restrains himself from being infinite. God is in heaven, that is God re remains within the limited physical existences. Uh, I'm sorry, God remains within the unlimited spiritual existences, and we remain in the limited physical existences. And he visits whenever he wants, he interferes whenever he wants, no one can stop him. Essentially, though, God is in heaven, God is in the spiritual. And we are down here in the physical, and there's a, a bridge that, the, the, that we hope can connect the two. This, the Alter Rebbe, the Baal uh, actually originally, and this is, again, a position of Torah people. I told you the story many times of Hashem is here, Hashem is there, and the argument, well, then how can Hashem be here and there? God is in heaven. Uh, the pushback is that the doctrine of Tzimtzum, as it's understood, not literally, originated by the Baal that says that God is here. 
God is in this room. God is in this physical. God is the world. The world is God. But the world is not all that God is. God is not limited to the world. But God is in this physical world. I, we don't see it. Well, that's because God restrains himself from ex- overwhelming us with the expression of his existence so as not to sort of uh, overwhelm us and frighten us off like music that's so loud you can't hear it or a light that's so bright that it blinds. This we're going to develop in greater detail. And it's a concept that we have talked about before, which again underscores this idea that you can't only talk about how we have a relationship with Hashem without knowing who Hashem is, or without talking about Hashem. So we talk about Hashem in, mostly in this section of Tanya. And in the previous section, we talked about having a relationship with Hashem. The two overlap and intertwine with each other. And again, the Alter Rebbe's decision was strategically to first print the Sefer Shel Benanim, which speaks more about our relationship with Hashem, and only now, secondary, to print the, uh, the or to, to publish the, the, um, the Shari Yichad Vamunah, as we'll talk about, which helps us understand, well, who is this Hashem that we have a relationship with? What is it more detailed and nuanced? And this follows a healthy pattern that the more intensely our relationship develops, the more we want to have a sense of with whom we are having this relationship, the more we want to have this closeness and this bond together with the infinity of Hashem. So here we go. As you'll note, <coughs> um, whichever the volumes you're following along, if you have volume two of the lessons in Tanya, or if you have a standard print of the Tanya, uh, the, here we go. It is Lakuti Amarim Chelik Sheni. This is the collection of teachings, section two, Hanikra, which the Alter Rebbe has called B'Shem Chinuch Katan, the entryway, the gateway into education. Now, as we'll note that the Alter Rebbe here starts the uh, essay with a directive towards education. And of course, when we think of education, we think of a teacher or a parent educating a child. Concurrently, of course, everybody has to be educated. Learning never ends. But even the term chinuch, which we just translate as education, which conjures up school and recess and classrooms and homework, comes from or is related to the word to be rededicated, like Hanukkah is about the rededication of the Beis HaMikdash. We might say that it comes from the term to cure or to mature or to develop or to expand upon our character and our identity. Here you'll note this is similar to what we have before. Malukah, it is a collection from scribes and books, often understood to refer to the Magid al Rebbe's teacher, the Maral, Rabbi Yehuda Lowy of Prague, and the Baal Shem Tev, the, the Arizal, and other uh, uh, forerunners of, of these teachings, uh, names that you've recognized. Kedoshi Elyon, of the loftiest level of holiness, Nishmasam Eidan, their souls are in Ganeidin. Miyusud, and it is founded al Parshu Vishenesh al Kriyashma, on the first chapter of the Kriyashma, which again makes the ultimate declaration of Hashem Echad. <clears throat> That Hashem is one, and again, not just there's one Hashem, like there's one book on the table, but that Hashem is one and is absolute oneness. The Alter Rebbe begins with a quote from Mishlei, the book of Proverbs. It reads, So Shlomo Amelech, in his wisdom, writes, <clears throat> Educate a child according to, and this is the emphasis, his way, the, uh, the possessive pronoun indicated by the letter Vav at the end of the word, derech. So it doesn't say educate a child according to the way, but it, it says educate a child according to his way, darkoi. And if you do that, even when he grows old, he will not deviate from it. So the Alter Rebbe asks, Hine, since the Pasuk says, Al pi dar koi, according to his way, Mashma, it suggests, She'ena derech ha'emes la'amitoi, that this is not the path that is the truth of truth. Now, we have talked about this before, and again, <clears throat> you'll note that many of the concepts that we discuss here in Shaykh Vamuna are already touched upon in the Sefer Shel Benanim, as we talked about. Now, in the Sefer Shel Benanim, we talked about this word, MS, 
The word MS translated simply as truth. It's a, a very sort of romantic word. Everybody is pursuing truth. This is where we write books about songs and plays and people are spending their lives in pursuit of truth. But what is truth? How do we know when we get to truth? So that sounds a little bit like a cop out, you know, oh, what, what is truth? Everybody in Stateville tells you, what do you mean truth? <clears throat> How do we understand? What is Torah's definition of truth? Now, in this context, it's quite important for us to remember that Hashem is, regardless of whether it's true or not, meaning if we were to make the argument that true means that it's re replicatable in the laboratory, so then uh, that would make science truth and science master. And we say that Hashem is master. So even if Hashem doesn't conform to Euclidean geometry, it does not disrupt the, uh, the perfection, the totality, the completion of God's identity. So we have to be very cautious when we use this word. Again, it sounds very, i calling it romantic to say truth, that we're in the pursuit of truth, and I'm looking for truth, and I'm a truth seeker. It's a virtuous thing. I'm not knocking it, but it's very, we have to be very careful when we, when we describe, well, how, we, how you know when you find it? <laughs> What's the barometer that determines that something is true? So amongst the many descriptions and discussions, what, what um, the Alter Rebbe has mentioned earlier in Tanya is that truth means that it's true under all circumstances. That it's not, it's not just a circumstantial truth, although there can be circumstantial truths. If I say that water boils at 212 degrees, that's a circumstantial truth. It's that at sea level, but at a high mountain or at a low valley, it changes. It doesn't mean it's untrue. It means it's true in the moment and true in the circumstance, which again, if we're trying to be um, deceptive, that be, sounds like a, a workaround against uh, uh, honesty, but we understand the concept. So uh, by, the, by uh, Shlomo HaMelech saying, educate a child according to, and again, the emphasis being his way, it seems to suggest that this is not the true way. It's not true under all circumstances. That's not going to be true later on. This is, of course, a, a, a great peril when it comes to literal education. On the one hand, you want to teach a child according to his way. And if a child's in second grade, you can't give him an eighth grade material. On the other hand, you can't water it down so extremely, or you might say dumb it down, that when they grow up, they find out that what you told them is not even true. So it's crucial that while we're teaching a child at their capacity of understanding, we also are not uh, uh, hiding the absolute truth. Um, I mean, the Rebbe talks about this when it comes to matters like the shape of the luchais, which are often misrepresented uh, as having been round on top when they were, the Gemara says they were rectangular. And again, you might say, well, who cares? It's just for kids. It's, well, because that kid grows up, he finds out that's not true. It becomes an excuse for him to say, well, nothing you taught me is true. Everything you tell me is a story. Everything is made up, uh, et cetera. Ah, but a child, he can't do it and he can't understand it. So he'll know that there's things that he can't understand, but he'll grow into it. So this is where we need to be cautious. But back to the point at hand, the Alter Rebbe is asking the question, why does Shlomo HaMelech recommend that we teach a, a child according to his way, suggesting that it's his way and it's not the true way, so he won't outgrow it? Why? We would want him to outgrow it. How often do we hear about people who learned something when they were six or eight years old, and then they say, well, that sounded so dumb that I never pursued it any further, only to find out when they're 50 that what they were told when they were six or eight was told to them by somebody who didn't know what they were talking about. It was foolish or told them in a childish manner. And here they've dismissed all of a certain category of life based on an eight-year-old's understanding. So <clears throat> why is it a virtue to teach a child, again, according to his way and not according to the way? What's the mind? Uh, what, why is this a benefit that he'll never deviate from it? We want him to deviate. We want him to outgrow it. Ah, however, know ye this. What is the root and the yesoy, the foundation of the service of Hashem? Now, we have seen these terms before. They seem, and they are somewhat synonymous, but of course, everything is going to be a little bit nuanced. There are no true synonyms in Torah. There is nuanced, stiff distinction between the different terms. 
So what does it mean when we say the shirish root, like a root of a plant, and you saw it, a foundation like the foundation of a building. So our argument is, as the author ever says here, just to finish this sentence, they are reverence, fear, and love. That is, our reverence for Hashem leads us to not violate his instructions, and our love for Hashem leads us to fulfill all of his requests, mitzvahs, commandments, whether they are Torah commandments or they're rabbinic commandments, as we quote, will explain. Now, just amongst us, this is an, ex- an illustration. Dr. Rebbe here writes, as we will explain. However, we know that Hashem, that, that the Alter Rebbe already explained this to us. We find this idea that all mitzvah observance is driven by reverence for Hashem. And therefore, I don't violate his requests and love for Hashem. And therefore, I pursue connection via his instructions. This has already been taught to us in chapter four of Seva Shalbaninim. However, again, when the Alter Rebbe wrote the Shari Chadvamuna, the strategy was to print this first and then print the Seva Shalbaninim. So that's why he's saying we will explain it when the, the Alter Rebbe zagged instead of zigged, and he printed the Seva Shalbaninim first. And he says, uh, and it's already been explained to us in chapter four. But again, this is an, an illustration of that strategy. But back to the point at hand. What is the difference, first of all, between a shayrish, a root, and a yesoid, a foundation? So a shayrish, like the, like the root of a tree, it nurtures the fruit to its maturity. And then the fruit can be separated from it. You don't eat the root, but without the root, the fruit never develops. It never ripens. It never becomes edible. The yesoid, however, is constant. You build a, a foundation to a building, and of course, you don't take the foundation away when the building is there. So the, the, these ideas of Ava and Yira, they both kickstart and they sustain the mitzvah fulfillment. Now, this, again, hopefully conjures up uh, some recognition in earlier parts in the Sefer Shalbanin. Not only does it get us going, meaning, as we'll see, the, the Ramam, for example, describes that it is appropriate, and we know this from our own life experience, that we entice a child to fulfill mitzvahs through things that appeal to a child. So at the simplest level, we tell them that if you do well, you get an uh, an aleph on your report, you feel good, you get to go from second grade to third grade, you get to go to camp, you get a prize. You don't do well, you get a bad grade, you feel bad, you get a sense of isolation, et cetera, et cetera, reward and punishment. Now, this is not only true, of course, of children, it's true of adults, where a person may mature, but they think, what's in it for me? I love Shabbos. It's so relaxing. So do I love Shabbos or I love relaxing? Well, Shabbos enables me to relax. So at that moment, it's really about me. (laughs) It's really about my own self. I love uh, meaning and purpose and so on. So I follow Torah and mitzvahs. But am I really loving Hashem or am I really loving what it does for me? I don't want to get yelled at, so I do what Hashem says. Am I really revering Hashem, or I just don't want to get yelled at, etc.? We all go through this maturation where we move from having a love for myself and what Hashem provides for me. We do this with other people as well. I really like that guy. He makes me laugh. So do I like that guy? Do I like to laugh? I like that person, or I like the way they help me, treat me, are kind to me, make me feel, etc. Is it them or is it me? And this is a progression. So that's the shayrish. At some point, we want to detach from that. Like the fruit becomes ripe. Excuse me. Like the fruit becomes ripe. And we want it to uh, be able to be separated from this dependence because, you know, the day will come when Shabbos won't be so restful, or the person will annoy me, or I won't be so desirous of being connected, or I won't like all of that discipline. And now what? So if it's about discipline and rest, and if it's about what it does for me, so now it's not doing it for me anymore, so I say goodbye. You know, you can't eat chocolate every day. At some point, I, uh, it, it, I outgrow it. It's no longer necessary. 
But on the other hand, we also say, or in addition, I should say, we also say that love and fear of Hashem is the Yisoy. It's the foundation. And this conjures up the message that the Alter Rebbe uh, taught us. If you recall the analogy of the bird, that a bird without wings is still a living creature. But the whole distinctive characteristic of the bird is sort of deficient. The whole virtue of a bird is its capacity to fly. And the likelihood of a bird surviving in the wilderness is pretty minimal if it, if it can't fly. The lion is going to eat it. <clears throat> the bird's wings are what give it the capacity to avoid, fly, uh, b- avoid being consumed by the forest. Analogously, a mitzvah without love and reverence of Hashem is still a mitzvah. If a person does a mitzvah out of compuncture, out of obligation, out of social conformity, it is still a mitzvah. And not us, of course, because we're perfect, but sometimes we do mitzvahs because that's what's expected of us. We do mitzvahs because we'll feel guilty if we don't. We do mitzvahs because we can't help ourselves. It's just part of our routine, uh, et cetera. But a mitzvah done without love and fear has, has limited life expectancy because the jungle of my animal soul that's constantly clamoring for my attention is likely to consume it unless it can fly above it. And without love and fear constantly nourishing it, the likelihood of it outlasting the animalistic impulses of uh, the, 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 the temptations that are dangling before my eyes is minimal. It's not impossible, but it's minimal. So this is also why the love and fear are not only what get us to do the mitzvah initially, like the root of the tree that gets the apple to ripen. And then you detach it from the tree and you, and you eat it. That is, you become separated. It, it's like the child who grows up and is now able to live on their own and is no longer dependent in that constant sense from their parent. And yet the love and fear that we infuse within our mitzvahs like the foundation of a home that must continuously be there, like the child who becomes uh, independent and yet, we hope, is is nourished by the healthy instruction of their parents. Um, As they mature and they become parents themselves, etc., they get out on their own independence. This, too, is the foundation that is continuously sustaining and supporting this uh, 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 characteristic of the relationship. So love and fear are both a shayrish, a root, like the tree, to be a little bit, I don't know, outgrown, maybe too harsh a word, but to eventually get to a certain point uh, where it's ripened and we're no longer doing it only because of what it does for me. And it is a continuous presence, a yesoy, a foundation, that is constantly the premise upon which my relationship with Hashem is expressing itself. So it both kickstarts and sustains my mitzvah fulfillment. <clears throat> now, the Alter Rebbe continues, O mitzvah who he gam came in mitzvah esek, mosh kasev arachayim simen shin mem gimel. Now, the mitzvah of chinech, the mitzvah to educate a child, is also a mitzvah, and the Alter Rebbe brings you the source in the Shulchan Aruch, which is in the Laws of Daily Activity in chapter 343. Now, why does the author have to point out this idea about the mitzvah of Chinuch? So again, on the one hand, that's the very pragmatic lesson that we're here to talk about, how to educate a child. And again, just like we talk about our relationship with Hashem, because we're too shy to talk about our relationship with other people, but talking about our relationship with Hashem feels far more virtuous than this namby-pamby, you know, person-to-person relationship thing. So too, we talk about educating our children, because the adults, we're already perfect, and we know everything, but maybe we want to educate our children. Now, in the mitzvah of chinuch, education, as we talked about, of course, it reflects back on ourselves, we find a curious uh, discussion. Upon whom is the mitzvah of education? So the obvious answer seems to be it's on the parents. A parent is obligated to educate their children, but does the child have any obligation themselves? So our immediate response is, well, of course not. They're a child. They have no halachic stature, and therefore they are exempt. It's purely on the parent. So if the child wants to go to McDonald's and eat cheeseburgers before their bar mitzvah or bas mitzvah, the child has no uh, issue. If they break something, the parent has to fix it, et cetera, et cetera. However, not so fast. 
there is such a, a, a nuance that says, wait, wait, the child does have a graduated sense of obligation that at a certain point, whether whatever age it is, at three and five and seven and 10 and 12, the child has to start to take on some sense of obligation themselves. And this has halachic ramifications. What if the example, an example being, what if the child makes an oath? Do we force the child to fulfill it? On the one hand, we'd say, well, no, there's a child. His statement has no legal stature. On the other hand, we say, well, they understand the meaning of an oath. And therefore, it's a good educational process to teach them. Or maybe they even have halachic uh, liability in their oath uh, execution. They must fulfill the oaths which they make. So we'll see. And here the Alter Rebbe is emphasizing it in the Chinuch, both on the educator and the educated. When it comes to the love of Hashem, it says at the end of Parshas Ekev, and you'll recognize this, it's from the Shema, as I command you, all of you, that's you in the plural, to do it, which is to love Hashem. And again, how is doing it love? Is love an action or is love a desire to be connected therewith? Now, in the Sefer Shalbanim, we discussed at some length, um, it's the Tanya of these last couple, last week in the Chitas, about various shades of love. We have the love of, of born of this world. That is, we look around at the world, we see how the world functions, and we say, pretty cool. There must be a designer to this great design. And since I'm so impressed by the designer of this great design, I want to be associated therewith. Uh, I, I don't have a particular appreciation for art, but if a person is very moved by art, whether it's music or it's performing arts or it's visual arts, they have a great desire to be associated with the artist, which, parentheses, is one of the reasons why we're so cautious about which art we expose ourselves to. Because there is a certain attraction to the artist. And if that artist comes from a bad space, from a place of, uh, of violence or a place of uh, tumma, we don't want to be associated with that. So we're real cautious about the art because we can't separate the art from the artist. Then we talk about overwhelming forms of love that are not limited, more like the love a parent has for a child. Why do you love that child? What do they do for you? What's it? It's not something you can describe. It's this innate sense of love. And this is really where we're going to be headed when we talk about how Hashem is the source of our life. And a person loves to be alive. Even, God forbid, a person who's not so in love with being alive, they're not against being alive. They just don't like their life. They have pain, they have suffering, they have loneliness, they have hardship, chas v'shalom, times a thousand, but they're not against life. If they would have uh, peace and calm and friendship and purpose and security and so on, they would want to live. So nobody, even God forbid, the person who's most uh, dissatisfied with life to the fact that to the point that they would even consider it worthless is not against life. They just don't like the suffering or more than don't like, I don't mean to underplay it. If that suffering would be alleviated, they would love life. They would want to be alive. They cling to life. The physical body clings to life. We defend ourselves. We hold de dearly onto life, as we'll see. So what does it mean that love has to do with La Soise to do it? Now, hopefully right away, we conjure up the um, title page of the Sefer Shalbanim that says that it's all based on the Pasek of behold, it is very near to you. This matter is very near to you in your mouth and in your heart that you may do it, which led to the whole discussion in the first 53 chapters. How is that? Our experience suggests otherwise. It doesn't seem like it's so intuitive to be completely transformed and close to Hashem. It doesn't even seem possible. And if we understand that in its most demanding form, that it is to only have love for Hashem, then that's only for the tzaddik. And it's not even within my purview. I can't even do it. It's like asking me to be taller. It's not within my capacity to achieve it. And so the Alter Rebbe explained that it is within our capacity to gin up enough love to get the job done. It doesn't mean I'll only love Hashem. 
It doesn't mean I only am interested in godliness. It does mean that my love for Hashem is strong enough that it's stronger than my desire to sit on the couch, gossip, do whatever negative thing it is. So love results in change behavior. But here we're saying that love is behavior. And this is going to be a nuanced distinction that we're going to be discussing here in the Shari Chedvamun. What does it mean that love is behavior? The Tzarech Lahavin, what we must understand, how can there be action in the type of love? How is love an action, so to speak? Now, um, when we talk about this procedure we, of love and, and how love has to result in action. The Alter Rebbe tells us, there's two types of Aves Hashem. Now, of course, there's many types. It's infinite. It's nuance. But this is one of the gifts that Hasidus does. It tries to give us definitive parameters to help us comprehend concepts which are innately infinite. It's very much what we're doing now with Sphira Sa'imer. We're trying to put the fine categories on character traits that are innately amorphous, meaning chesed is not only chesed. That's why chesed can blend in with gevura. The, 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 the sure sign of kedusha is the capacity of cooperation. So chesed is not rigid like a digit. So how can you count the spheroids? Well, that doesn't make any sense. Well, right, God is not limited to uh, a linear logic. So on the one hand, we're counting numbers. There's nothing more rigid than a number. 15 is 15. It's not 15-ish. It's absolutely. And yet, we're describing concepts that are innately amorphous. Chesed, but chesed that blends with gevura. And teferis that blends with gevura and chesed and, and all of the sviros and their capacity to blend together, which is very much how we experience life. On the one hand, we got real definitive things. Square is square, not round. On the other hand, our lives are not so rigid. We're not so bracketed by uh, our definition. When we try to categorize it, I mean, it's very insulting. If you get categorized, they would call customer service. You know, they, you're categorized in a box. It's very distant. Well, I'm trying to explain to you, sir, that it's a distant, well, according, you know, they read it to you from the manual. Thank you very much. On the other hand, if you have just, uh, 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 amorphous sense of it, you got total chaos. So two, both are true, and that's what the Alter Rebbe is referencing here. So, one is the desire for total forfeiture of self. One is out of here. I don't want to deal with this physical world I don't want to be uh, bounded by this physical world, not the Venavio, the two eldest sons of our own. I don't want to be part of all this. It's way too rigid, way too harsh. Kaloisa nefesh, surrender of the soul, to forfeit myself for Hashem. My love for Hashem is completely steamrolls my love for any of my own interest, interests. It completely eliminates my sense that, well, what's in it for me? How does this make my life better? What is it going to do for you? Like we talk about so much in the Sefer Shalbein and him, that this is really for tzaddikim. They have no struggle. There is no conflict. They've cleansed that complete uh, sense of human awareness and impulse, and it's only Torah and mitzvahs, as we'll see. Uh, it's, it's that kind of Radiance, they have only pleasure and joy in Hashem. They have only joy and they're only tiny, which we'll talk about. The translation of that word is pleasure or joy, but I want to use a different word for that because I think it maybe it's myself. It's a little misleading in the English. There's a nuance there that's worth talking about. Nifla. And who can have such a level of love? A tzaddik. And like we talk about what a tzaddik means, which we'll come back to in a moment, I just want to continue. This, like it says, the tzaddikim have only simcha in Hashem. And we talked about why it says tzaddikim. We'll, we'll come back to a couple of these nuances. I just want to finish it. 
but not everybody can merit to this, as we discussed so much in the Sefer Shalbanim. So let's back up here, uh, a whole bunch of steps just to get our parameters, and we'll look at some of the nuance, and, and we'll go through it. Remember, we said this time we go through, I'm going to be nuanced. Feel free to pull out the shepherd's crook and yank me back to the text. I won't be insulted. I know I have a tendency to go down these paths, but I hopefully it's uh, it, it's meaningful. Now, again, imagine you're learning Shaykh Vamuna and you never learned the Sefer Shalbanim. This is a chiddush. When we say the word tzaddik, and the Alter Rebbe quotes this in the beginning of the Sefer Shalbanim, tzaddik to us means a really good guy. He's a tzaddik. He, that guy's a super guy. He's such a tzaddik. And that's nice and it's beautiful. And you can even point to the Talmud where it says that if you win more than you lose, you do more mitzvahs than averas, you go in the up elevator and you're a tzaddik. You are tzaddik bedin. You emerge righteous in, in, in the um, deliberation. And we talk about that the tzaddikim are written and sealed on Rosh Hashanah, and it's the Bainanim who have to wait till Yom Kippur. And this doesn't mean a Bainani like the Alter Rebbe describes it in Tanya. It means a Bainani, 50 50. And that's a quote in the Gemara that says that a tzaddik who has one more mitzvah than Avera, he's going in the up elevator. <clears throat> However, the Alter Rebbe describes that there's a, a, a deeper meaning to what the term tzaddik means. And he quotes different statements in the Gemara, a person who's not repulsed by sin to the point that he'll tolerate somebody else doing the sin. I don't do it myself, but who am I? Means that there's a certain affinity that he has for that sin. Meaning, I don't say, God forbid, you see a child put his hand on the stove. Nobody says, you know, who am I? Some people like to put, I have no tolerance for it. I grab them away. So why is it that I might have tolerance for people doing some other Avera? I don't do it myself. Why do I have tolerance? If I had the capacity to stop them, that's the scenario, that I do have the ability. Why don't I jump in and stop them? Because at some level, it doesn't bother me that much. So, that, so I don't interfere because it doesn't bother me that much because at some level, that means I have an affinity to it. So what the Alter Rebbe laid out in the Sefer Shalbanim, which again, try to put yourself in the mindset that you don't know that, and here it's being alluded to, is that when we use the terms tzaddik and Russia and Benini, we're not talking about the judgment day. We're not talking about in the aggregate. We're not saying, does he do more mitzvahs than averas? We're not talking about it scorekeeping. For that, you don't need Tanya. Tanya is for having a meaningful relationship with Hashem and a consistent day, moment to moment to moment. So it becomes a method for us to have a barometer. Why does it matter? <laughs> Meaning if I'm supposed to be in the moment to moment, what's the difference? Well, it does become useful just like an experienced doctor can, can trust his intuition. And the guy who's not so experienced can't trust his intuition. So there is a value in a person recognizing his status, not just for the feel good of it. And I just want to know where I'm holding. I just want to know what my parameters are. There's a value in the person recognizing and being aware of his stature because it gives him a sense of his relationship with Hashem. And, uh, and again, not license, but his ability to trust his intuition or not trust his intuition. Now, the level of the tzaddik is that he has completely, uh, exclusively found his alignment with Hashem. Now, this term, taina, which we translate as pleasure, maybe it's just me because I'm a crass person. When I think of pleasure, I think of butterscotch pancakes much more than I think about doing Torah and mitzvahs. What does it mean? It means to be aligned. Where am I aligned? Am I aligned with Hashem or am I aligned with myself? So when a person says, I love Shabbos because it, 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 it's so restful, as we talked about, do I love Shabbos or I love rest? I like to rest. Shabbos gives me the opportunity to do what I want. And what's going to happen one day when Shabbos is not so restful? I told you the story six times. Uh, my brother was at a Shabbaton, the JLI retreat, and he was staying on the eighth floor. And he walks up the steps and the security guard says, why are you walking up the steps? He said, it's my day of rest. <laughs> you know, so um, the, 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 the concept of the tzaddik is the person whose love is not thought about. It is innate. It is like the relationship a person has with their physical self. I don't decide that this is my hand. It absolutely is that way. It's not, a, it's not a, even a conscious decision, which, which suggests that there's an opportunity to choose otherwise. 
you know, nobody, hopefully we don't tell our children good news. You're still our children because somebody offered me some other children. And I said, no, 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 my children are better. We debated it and I won. So therefore you're still my children. They said, well, I have cuter children, nicer children or more respectful children. And I said, no, no, my children are nicer and cuter and more respectful and I won. Why, why not? Because tomorrow they'll come up with nicer, cuter, more respectful children than I will trade them in. Meaning it's not something I would even consider. It's not at all a discussion. And if it is a discussion, then that means that there is the opportunity to be talked out of it. This is one of the reasons I think behind the Rebbe's general, general, with some exception, aversion to debates. Let's debate this uh, other faith, atheists, Jews for whatever. Why? Because I'm conceding that it's debatable. You know, it's like the guy says, why won't you debate the Holocaust denier? Because I'm not willing to concede. Even if you win, you lose. Because you were willing to debate it. That means you're willing to consider that it's not true. And if you're willing to consider it's not true, you've already lost. Even if you win, you lose. So this is the level of the tzaddik. There's no struggle. There's no debate. He sees everything through the glasses of Kedusha. And we touch this and we see this. We've told this example before. When you reach up to kiss the mezuzah, you go, oh, wait, I'm in O'Hare Airport. There's no mezuzah uh -huh. here. That means you have become so aligned. And you ask a child, what is the purpose of money? To put in the pushka. You have to bring tzedakah every day. You know, some people use money to buy groceries. Really? You know, it's like, you know why? It, <laughs> this is a joke, but it's probably what happened. Somebody called up the RV place and said, I'd like to rent a tank. You know, some people use those to go camping. No, they're for mitzvah tanks. Really? People use mitzvah tanks to go camping? Who knew? Right? Meaning, do we see it as Kedusha that can also be used for Gashmias? Or do we see it as primarily Gashmias? And guess what? It serves Kedusha. This is the level of the tzaddik. And again, why do we have to know about it? We're not going to beat tzaddikim. Not because we're not trying hard enough. And not because we're lazy. And not because, well, let's be realistic. You really think it? it's because that's the nature of most of us, I mean, not us, we're good, but other people, most people don't even have this innate capacity, not because they're not trying hard enough and not because they failed. These are gifted neshamas, just like there are gifted musicians. And this guy practices the piano 10 hours a day and plays reasonably well. And this guy practices 10 hours a day and is a concert pianist. It's not for lack of trying. There's a certain characteristic that is embedded within certain people that is, again, not the product of their effort. It's not because they tried harder. It's not because they believed in themselves. It's simply a gift that comes from above. Now, you may recognize that this Pusik that the Alter Rebbe quotes here, Simchut Tzadikim Bashem, rejoice righteous ones, plural, Tzadikim in Hashem, rejoice righteous ones in Hashem. This Pusik, the Alter Rebbe quoted much earlier in Tanya, it's like chapter 12, where he talked about the Bainini. The Bainini, which we aspire to be, is the person who is able to overcome their impulses. Rabbi Shesh Taub uses, I think, a very uh, a powerful illustration. He says, on Yom Kippur, the tzaddik doesn't even get hungry because he's so connected with Hashem and Hashem so dislikes eating on Yom Kippur that the tzaddik doesn't even get hungry. The Bainini gets hungry. That's not a failing, but he doesn't eat. He would never consider eating. But he has not lost his innate human desire for food. The Russia would consider eating, even if he doesn't eat. The fact that he would think about it, not just be annoyed by the hunger pangs, but he would say, you know, I'm going to go eat. I don't care what the rules are. I'm going to go eat. Well, okay, well, maybe that is I'm in charge. I'll do what I think is what I want. Not what I think is right, what I want to do. The Bainini gets hungry, but he doesn't eat. So the tzaddik gets to that level. Can we ever get to the level where we don't get hungry on Yom Kippur, where we don't have any interest in material things for material things' sake? Maybe we touch it from time to time. Again, these are gifted neshamas. Why is it important for us to know? So earlier in the Seva Shal Bainanim, the Alter Rebbe quoted this pasuk: Simchu Tzadikim. Be joyous, righteous ones in the plural in Hashem. Why does the Alter Rebbe? What is the what is the reference to the tzaddikim? Who are the tzaddikim? So the Alter Rebbe uh, emphasizes that a bainani can be so uplifted by another tzaddik, so inspired, even transformed by that tzaddik, that he can from time to time touch this. 
there's an explanation that is given. Why do we make a special day on Sukkot for the willow branch? The last day of Sukkot before Shmini Atzeres is called Hashanah Rab. And it's a day when the, when the the tradition is that we bang five willows on the ground. And curiously, although Rosh Hashanah can fall on Shabbos and we won't blow the shofar, and Sukkot can fall on Shabbos and we won't shake the lulav and esrig, when we went to a mathematical calendar, we deliberately made it that Hoshana Rabbah will never fall on Shabbos and will always be able to beat the willow. We ask, why? What's so special? It's not a mitzvah in Torah. It's not a rabbinic mitzvah. Why is this so important? So amongst the many explanations, one of them is that the willow we know of the four items in the lulav and esrit has neither aroma nor does it produce any fruit unlike the esrig that has aroma and it produces a fruit, the lula produces a fruit but has no aroma, the myrtle has aroma and doesn't produce a fruit, the willow has neither. So it is, quote, the least amongst them. Why then does it get its own day? So amongst the many explanations, we say that since it spent a whole week together with the esrig, together with the tzaddik, who had both aroma and taste, meaning it had both mitzvah fulfillment and Torah scholarship, so the willow becomes transformed to the point that it gets its own day. It gets its own day because it has been so transformed by being in the presence of the esrig for this entire week. So similarly, Sumchut Sadiqim. Why does the Alter Rebbe even bother to tell us about Sadiqim? This is the book for the aspiring Bainini. And even the Alter Rebbe sort of, I use this term jokingly, slips up and tells us, that even Bainini is just an aspiration. We don't really expect it, as he uses the phrase, halavai Bainini. We wish we'd be a Bainini. <clears throat> so why is he telling us about Sadiqin? So first of all, aspirations, you know, look for it, try and so on. And the idea that you can touch it from time to time. Life is not just an endless struggle of always doing what you don't really want to do or what your animal soul doesn't want to do. You can touch these moments. But to be constantly at that level, you don't need to, but that's not the audience members for Tanya. Everyone can learn from everything, but that, that's not the, the struggling person who's come to the Alter Rebbe asking for guidance. That's one level of love. This Abba B'Tanugim, where my only joy is Hashem. I have no other joy. I have no interest in anything else. I only have interest in Hashem. But not everybody can merit such a level. Because in order to do that, a person has to purify, has to polish, has to clarify his crass humanity extraordinarily. And learn a lot of Torah. That is not because you need to pass the test, but to completely align my thinking with godliness. That is to overcome the, the, the innate, intuitive, what's in it for meanness and do a lot of good deeds, which we've talked about. It's not just about doing mitzvahs. A person can do a mitzvah, but not in a way that it is good, because he's doing it, again, out of rote obligation, out of impulse, et cetera, et cetera. But he has to do it in a way that it aligns him consciously with Hashem. Lezakos, to merit, l'neshama salyena, to touch on such a lofty neshama. I just want to finish the, the, this uh, uh, sentence and come back. Like it's described. Now, what does this mean? Earlier, or we know this, in Sefer Shalbain and Malta Rebbe talks about what is the status of different neshamas. Now, we know that people are not physically identical. Some people are tall. Some people are fast. Some people are dexterous. Some people are left-handed. There's all kinds of characteristics. Nobody expects that all people should be humanly identical. What about spiritually? Are we spiritually identical? So there is a common presumption that says, no, some people are naturally more sensitive. Some people are naturally more scholarly. Some people are naturally more compliant. Everybody's got a spiritual distinction. And that's why this person is taken uh, by, or uplifted, inspired by this by one characteristic of, uh, of, uh, of godliness, another by a different characteristic. It fluctuates all around, all different formats of how a person is inspired, touched, moved, uplifted, et cetera, et cetera. So this would seem to suggest that every neshama is different. 
And we say it in the davening. The first thing we say, that you have returned my neshama. My neshama is different than your neshama. Every neshama is different. You're unique, just like everybody else. So does that innately mean that just like there are people who are objectively taller, objectively have a higher IQ, objectively faster, objectively more nimble. So there are people who are objectively at a greater level of an neshama. So the answer is no, but yes, but no. So we explain. Every neshama is the product of the very essence of Hashem. Some neshamas are more evidently and some are a little less so. The Alter Rebbe uses an analogy that in the conception of a child, the entirety of that child, the complexity of the brain and the ordinariness of the fingernails all originate from the same act of conception. They are all absolutely the byproduct of that same act of conception. What's the difference? As the neshama, as the child develops, they are nuanced. And as we have learned, if the Alpha doesn't mention this, but just as another way in which science brings us to a greater understanding of Torah, the DNA, your whole identity is found in one hair, in one fingernail. And that aspect of ourselves that we easily dismiss and discard contains the, the blueprint of your entire identity. Everything about you can be found in the fingernail, like in the brain. So are all children the product of the same parents? Yes, this child looks more like the parent. This one has more of their sense of humor. This one is more uh, similar, et cetera, et cetera. So yes, there are neshamas that are born with greater sensitivity. They're less developed. You can sort of recognize the godliness within them. And those that are far more developed in the sense of processed, maybe a better word, less evidently uh, recognizable to their divine origin and element. And as such, they're more struggled with it. But it's not an objective race. Everybody has an independent relationship with Hashem. And therefore, while all, everybody is, is uh, expected to do the mitzvahs, the level of the relationship is what we're talking about. Meaning the Altar did not have to write Tanya to teach you to keep kosher. For that, we got a hundred other books to tell you uh, how to fulfill the mitzvahs. This is about that level of relationship. So that level of relationship of the tzaddik, again, is unattainable by most of us, but it is something that we can reach for, and we can occasionally touch it, and we can be inspired by those who touch it, and we can be transformed by those who give us an insight to it. Vashenis, what is this second level of love? And again, we're, we're using very general terms. This is one that is accessible to all of us. He ava shakal adam yachle Every person can reach this level of love. What is, what is the character to this level of love? The key word here is the analysis that one can contemplate deeply, which we'll talk about, in their heart, which is a little odd. We usually think of contemplating in the head, not in the heart. We'll talk about it. In matters that will stimulate the love to Hashem in the heart of every Jew. Now, again, we have insight to this as a result of uh, the Sefer Shalbeni. So let's back up. In Torah, we don't find much reference to the brain. We do find a lot of reference to the heart. Hashem says to his heart, the end of all creation has come before me when he's frustrated with um, the, the, the generation that leads to the flood. Uh, David HaMelech says in his heart, in contrast, the bad guys always, their heart says it to them. Haman's heart says to him, the king wants to favor me. Asaf says in his heart, my father uh, is going to die, that I'm going to kill Yaakov, etc. Now, the head-heart dynamic in the Sefer Shalbeninim is the conflict between the seat of, not the presence of, but the seat of the uh, godly soul and the animal soul. Now we explain. There is, of course, the godly soul in the heart. There is love that is godly, the love of another, the love of Hashem. There is, of course, the love that is self-serving, the love of materialism, the love of self-satisfaction, the love of, um, of self, etc. There is godliness in the intellect, the capacity not just to study Torah, but the capacity 
to recognize that there is something greater than myself. That is the key to godliness. The, the human ability, unlike the animal, to literally lift their head up and see the infinity of the sky. We look to the heavens and we say, from nothingness comes my salvation, as opposed to an animal that's on all fours and only sees what's staring it in the face. So godliness in the intellect is the ability to see beyond myself, to know that there's something more than me. Ungodliness in the intellect is to develop more sophisticated ways to satisfy myself. So if I think, what do I want? Now figure out a way to get it. So my intellect is serving my heart. When I say, what is there beyond myself and then desire to love it, that is my heart following my intellect. So in the Seva Shalbanim, the Alter Rebbe laid out that generally speaking, as an indicator, if something starts in the heart, it tends to be more like the animalistic that simply reacts, like the heart reacts. You get scared, your heart beats faster. You get excited, your heart beats faster. Generally speaking, that's a tell that it's coming from the what's in it for me animalistic self, generally speaking. And then it's going to go to the brain and it is brilliant at convincing itself how good it is. Driving around the barricade because I got a four wheel drive and this snowstorm is not going to stop me. We get brilliant at being incredibly foolish when our desire is that strong. If the Talmud says nobody sins unless they're acting foolishly. It's never logical to sin. It's fun. It's delicious. It's never a clever idea. It's never a sound idea. It's fun, but it's not a smart idea. Um, in contrast, when something comes from the intellect, it's generally an indicator that it's coming from something beyond myself. It's outside of me. It's my ability to look beyond myself and thus to get excited about it. So here the Alter Rebbe blends these two together. When we engage in Kishi is burning, when we analyze, which is again, not about how many pages of the Talmud I know. It's not about the material. It's about the willingness to imagine that there was something other than myself, to go outside of myself, which can only happen in the intellect. Of course, in, in, in the starkest contrast, we don't expect a child to be aware of anything other than themselves. They're tired, they cry. They're tired, they fall asleep. They're hungry, they cry. We don't say to them, well, don't you realize there are other people? But hopefully, we hope, that as the child ages, we mature the child and we say, you're hungry, other people are hungry. You want it, it's not yours. Now, you can lecture the raccoon all day and night. He's going to knock over the garbage pails because he has no capacity for intellect. Yes, you can train them. You can hit him on the snout enough times so he'll stop chewing up the, the shoes and the couch, not because they have some comprehension. We do the same thing with children. I mean, I, I know the analogy is a little crass. We tell the child, good job. Then they do it. They don't know what they're doing. They know that if they, if they walk, if they crawl, if they say that two plus two equals four, and they can list off the names of all the capitals, we give them the reward. We haven't taught them to go beyond themselves. We hope to, but we don't expect it from them, but it's across the spectrum. And this is what it means to be bar mitzvah or bas mitzvah, it means the mitzvah dictates my behavior, as opposed to the cheers, the gratitude, the, the reward that dictates my behavior. We become the son or daughter of the mitzvah. So the Alter Rebbe tells us that everybody who has the capacity for intellect, has the ability to think that there's something other than myself. And this will stir up a love. And that's why, again, just to reread this, the second level, everybody can reach it when they will think deeply. Because again, thinking can just be, let me figure out a way to get what I want. What do you want more than anything else? Now figure out a way to get it is my intellect pointed down. It's pointed towards my heart. And we are upright human beings. Our head is above our heart. And our literal physical capacity to look up to the infinite, more than opposable thumbs, is our capacity to get beyond ourselves. So when we're thinking about how do I get what I want, I am allowing my heart to dictate my head. That's It's curious that when Paro rallies up the troops to go and chase the Jews down at the Red Sea, it says they're like one heart and one man. When we receive the Torah at Sinai, we are like one man with one heart. Paro, they want, so they all commit themselves because it will fulfill what I want. 
at Sinai, I want, and therefore, I, I'm sorry, I understand, so therefore I want. My intellect, and again, not about analysis, my intellect is my ability to go beyond myself. And that's why the Alter Rebbe says, or what's alluded to, what the Alter Rebbe says, in the depth of the heart. You don't think in the heart, you think in the brain. But true thinking results in the heart, in matters that stimulate love in the heart of all Jews. Why? Because since a Jew, by his existence, means that he has an actual part of Hashem, again, back to the neshama. The neshama, there's two neshamas. There's the neshama that gives me physical life, the animating soul that gives life, the, the animating soul that gives life to, to the mineral, that gives life to the vegetable, that gives life to the animal, that gives us human life. The, the energy force that gives me life, that, 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 that innately is self-protective, a tree has that. It will bend itself to get sunlight. An animal certainly has that. It has emotion. The distinctive characteristic of being a Jew, why a Jew is a different spiritual entity than a non-Jew, is not the product of Hebrew school or eating latkes. It is that there is an actual part of Hashem that is unfiltered, undeveloped in a good way. That is, it's the raw essence of the infinity of Hashem. I mean, the microphone has it too. The physical items have it too. But we have to evoke it. So just like a child intuitively loves Hashem, it loves their parents, and even physical matter intuitively regresses back to its origin. If a Jew says, you know, I tried it, I went to shul, I didn't like it, it's not for me. So it's, it's possible that some things are not for me. Maybe I'm not a piano player. I could try to play the piano, it's not for me. How do we know, how does the Alter Rebbe have the certainty to declare that every Jew can reach this level? And the answer is what we've mentioned back in the Sefer Shalbanin, in which here we're getting sort of the two blended together, is because we have an actual spark of Hashem, that is, we are actually one with Hashem. Therefore, innately within every Jew is his desire to be connected with Hashem. So we call that loving Hashem. Now, it's not maybe loving like I love something that's pleasing to me. Like every child loves their parents. So the child says, well, my father's a Democrat and I'm a Republican. Or my father and I don't see eye to eye. We don't get along. It's not that he doesn't love his father. He doesn't love what his father has done. He doesn't, he has a desire to be associated. We know this physiologically because our DNA is our parents, even if he's a different political party. He's, it, the, the greatest predictor of a person's biology are their parents, even if his father is very different characteristically and behaviorally. The, I, the essence is still the same. So the Alter Rebbe's predication is, or predicate is, that every Jew has an actual part of God. Therefore, they want to be connected with God. That's truly what they want, right? It could be people had bad experiences, and it's too painful, etc. Understood. It doesn't change that that's truly what they desire. That's what they truly want. And what happens? It gets buried. It gets buried under layers of materialism. It gets buried under labor, layers of bad experiences. We've all heard this. People say, oh, I once went to the synagogue and the rabbi had bad breath, or this religious person who I knew and he was a liar, or kosher food doesn't taste good, or whatever it is. I mean, I'm not against the innate of it. I just had a, a bad experience. And we need to peel back those layers. What's the mechanism that will break through all of those is the contemplation that we think it's not about ourselves. This is that second level of love. Okay, I'm sorry I went a little lengthy there. Uh, we'll stop here, continue next week.